Thank you very much for joining us for this debate coming to you from the World Economic Forum annual meeting of new champions in Dalian, China. We're looking at the Climate Smart Investment Opportunity. The IFC sees this opportunity standing at some $23 trillion from this point to 2030. And uh, we're going to be drilling down into the leadership required to realize this opportunity, especially considering the U.S. has pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord reached in December 2015. Joining me to take the discussion further is Joaquin Levy. He's Managing Director and Chief Financial Officer of the World Bank. We're joined by Victor Chu, who is Chairman and CEO First Eastern Investment Group, Shanghua Wu, who is Director, China and Asia Office of Jeremy Rifkin, and we're joined by Faike Sibesma, the CEO and Chairman of the Managing Board, Royal DSM. Thank you so much for joining me. Dr. Levy, let's start with the World Bank and the leadership position that the World Bank is taking when it comes to climate change. Well, thank you. I think that, uh, as you put, uh, climate change is something that uh, actually creates a great uh, opportunity for growth. There's so much to be done, actually improving the standard of living of uh, people, creating jobs. In many places of the world, you see that now, uh, say, renewable energy uh, creates more jobs than traditional forms of uh, energy. So we see uh, across the world, uh, including in developing countries, emerging markets, of course, China, India, uh, enormous opportunities. And uh, our role is really to help to, to mobilize finance, work with the private sector, with governments to get the right environment to uh, move forward. And I can tell you, uh, the demand of the countries uh, where we operate is tremendous. I mean, governments, business there are really looking uh, forward to get uh, green building, to get smart transportation, and of course, uh, power, which is fundamental for ensuring growth. So that's what we've been doing. So Victor, you are finding the opportunities across emerging markets. Can you give me a little bit of depth in terms of the most exciting opportunities you're seeing in the, the current landscape? Well, we like energy efficiency because these are the low, you know, low hanging fruit and you can actually um, establish savings within a year to 18 months. But more long term, we're also looking at opportunities in renewable energy, solar, wind, you know, uh, coal gen. And we are doing this on a worldwide basis. But I think what's very important to note is that the private sector and local communities is a vital part of the participants. We need you know, public-private partnership to make Paris work, because Paris provides the vision, the strategy, but on real projects, you need a PPP. And we also need institutions, such as the like of the New York Green Bank or UK's Green Investment Bank, to provide the primary equity and the primary debt you know, to, to invest alongside private sector and multilateral institutions such as the World Bank, IFC, ADB, AIIB. So that kind of a partnership uh, is really the key. And in the case of China, they not only need one green investment bank or one New York green bank, they need 30. They need basically the size of China, need one green investment bank in every province or provincial level uh, regions. So that's the excitement uh, of, the, of, of the time and the cycle. Shanghua, you have been heavily involved in research in technology and in climate change. And I'm very interesting, I'm very interested rather, to find out the, the trends that you uh, are keeping abreast of at the moment, insofar as the opportunities that Victor is alluding to. Definitely. Uh, I think I echo what uh, uh, Victor just has said. Uh, it's, it's Yes, not only say we need 30 more green investment banks, it's already happening. Uh, there are a lot of thinking, uh, piloting happening now uh, from private sectors, from subnational governments. Uh, people really started seriously looking into how to greening our finance system. And uh, besides the green finance, the green bond, China already taking steps forward. And uh, besides the traditional conventional roles like you know China Development Bank and others, you're going to see actually very soon down the road there are going to be more financial platforms set up that set up particularly actually with the mission uh, for the green growth there. Uh, back to uh, other issues here. 
Uh, I think China, compared to many other parts of the world today, China happens to be the best place uh, to test out, to harness the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, the drivers are obvious, obvious in a way. So living in China, uh, we are literally experiencing the environmental ecological constraints. In China, so air pollution, everything. water I live in pollution. Beijing, everything. So in China, the way the official language is, we call it ecological security. Interesting enough, we already lift this issue up to the law. So in China, there's a national security law. In it, there are specific articles talking about ecological security, how to address this from that security perspective. Uh, in the meantime, as I said, the technologies are here. You know, China sends it, feels it, China already in it. China has to figure out how to be, not only be part of the new industrial revolution, but how to lead it. So the technology drivers, the environmental national security drivers, they all coming together, aligned with the demand from the society. So, this is a sort of moment in China where we're literally creating a new climate economy. So it's not just to say climate is here, somehow we have to deal with it, but rather China sees the opportunity to transform the economy. And it's a, that's, and it's it's a necessity. And pretty much so, actually. It's perfectly aligned together. This is the best place to see that. Fakir, you are passionate about climate change, and I know that you are mobilizing CEOs. What is your outlook as it stands right now, given the US pulling out of the, the Paris Climate Accord. How did you react when you heard the news? Disappointed. Uh, disappointed by the uh, withdrawal from the Paris Agreement because 97% of the scientists in the world agree climate change is a real issue. Almost 200 governments agreed in Paris to address climate change many business leaders in the world, and it's interesting to see that many business leaders in the world reacted on the US withdrawal, but none of them said this was a good thing. So scientists, governments, business people, and NGOs agree that the climate debate is over, it is a real issue. Good, what do we need to do from a business perspective uh, to future-proof our business, to take care that we are prepared for the future? that we put a price on carbon, that we take our measures, that we are prepared to live in a carbon-free or carbon-reduced world, uh, that we develop the new technologies. And it is, of course, a moral obligation for us not to pass on the bill to next generation. It is a social responsibility for us because otherwise we trigger migration and all kinds of difficult things. But it's also an economic opportunity. And it would be for business pretty stupid not to future-proof your business. So I would call all business in the world to take actions. And look to Victor uh, from the financial sector. I mean, he is a good guy investing already in these technologies. But I would we like to say... Victor has deep pockets. <laughs> uh, true, but I would like to say, and I'm not sure about Victor's opinion about this, but is the financial sector broadly engaging also, are investors broadly engaging on this? Because that's what we need also. Investors, shareholders, etc., making a stronger point of this. And not You've only ignited Dr. Levy. He wants to come in here. Yeah, I, I think he's absolutely right. And uh, uh, we see a, a shift from the private sector and financial markets. And uh, one very interesting thing was what was put by the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, and the Bloomberg report, which is really mobilizing the private sector in uh, looking what are the risks, business risks, uh, of climate change. And I think this conversation is really changing the perception of the private sector. They realize that the climate is real. Also, there has been a change in technology. Nowadays, there are many cases where smart technologies, actually even from a pure business point of view, makes more sense than traditional technologies. So I think that uh, the private sector will play, and is already playing, uh, a tremendously important uh, role in uh, changing perception, changing the conversation, which together with the local communities uh, puts uh, our work in terms of uh, really, uh, say, matchmakers um, uh, easier and, uh, I mean, much more thrilling because we do see the demands and we know about some of the instruments that we have that you can make available through IFC that you mentioned, MIGA, other parts of the, the World Bank, and together with other uh, development banks, including uh, national development banks, uh, to put all these uh, possibilities of investment, of growth, of transformation really uh, happening now. The future is now. 
Dr. Levy, you mentioned matchmaking. Fake, I know there are a number of partnerships on this very stage that you are at the center of. Perhaps you can allude to some of those at this point. Right. Uh, I think that, of course, like we said, private public partnerships are important. Take one angle which uh, Mr. Levy and myself know very well, and that is putting a price on carbon which is a collaboration between the private sector and the public sector. The public sector can set rules and make laws, but they don't have the innovative power to really put the laws and the regulations into real practical innovations. So that is the private sector's role. But you are put, working directly with the World Bank. Exactly. We are working together from the private yeah, and private. public sector. We do it together with Catherine McKenna, the Canadian Minister of Environment, to put a price on carbon. Already thousand companies in the world have an internal price on carbon, like our company has, 50 euros a ton. Why do we work with that internal price on carbon? Already to trigger the mindset internally that one day we will get an external price on carbon and better future-proof your business to be prepared on that one. And what do we do with the price on carbon? We anchor thinking about climate change into our economic system. They were not only dependent on the goodwill of some CEOs, but we anchor it in our economic system that it makes sense to address climate change from an economic perspective. And I think these kind of measures are very important to get at the end of today also the financial sector fully involved. I, I do want yeah. to talk about the, the carbon markets and the return of the carbon sure. markets, which is a big debate point in Davos. But you want to add here, Shang Wang? Sure, sure, sure. I, I want to say, actually, so what DSM Fike is talking about needs to be scaled up. Uh, so we started to see actually cases like leadership companies like DSM and others starting to take actions internally without really the global or even regional carbon market, but they are willing to take the actions internally. And that part needs to be scaled up very quickly, uh, which is sort of happening a little bit slow in terms of the expectations there. So, so there are players in the private sector, if I rephrase what you're saying, that are leading the charge. Yeah. We need to see more actions. You, you know, the, I think the CEO analyzes or whatever. You need to bring more CEOs actually into that landscape to scale up. I think that's the big, big gap actually today. Back to the green finances, the finance side actually. I think even back in Paris, I think financial sectors uh, uh, were there uh, at the Paris Agreement to discussion, everything like that. For a moment, it was very exciting to see the financial institutions coming on board. But then between Paris and now, we started to see a gap. Gap in a way, say, yes, we all have this sort of vision, direction, roadmap, whatever, excitement about the solutions. Then actually the financing part is not really catching up at the speed actually we would like to see. So there are issues within that landscape. And we all know, so on one side, we have the fourth industrial revolution, all those exciting technologies are happening. We seem to have a hope. We know there are solutions. In many, many cases, they are disruptive. The disruptive part, actually, is a sort of against how the financial institutions work. Because for investors, uh, they care about two things, risks, right? And uh, they don't want to... And reward would be the next, risk and reward. Yeah, risk and reward. And how do we bring that together quickly? I think that's also another focus, focusing areas that need to be really, really examined. Victor, mm -hmm. risk and reward, mm -hmm. how do we bring it together when it comes to climate finance opportunities? Uh, I think the investment case of climate uh, projects is very compelling. I mean, as uh, Frankie said, it is a moral and social responsibility. But on top of that, it is a very um, attractive investment. I mean, what we need to uh, ensure is that the equity portion is available. I mean, that's always, like all infrastructure projects, it's the equity portion that's difficult. We will really need to uh, galvanize the uh, family offices the long-term investors, even cloud funding to provide the equity part, the debt side and co-investment side is relatively easy once you have the seed capital. Are the rewards there, though, before I come to you, Dr. Absolutely. A absolutely. The, the Do you need very patient capital? You need people with longer-term horizon. It's not a conventional private equity investment. You don't, it's not a case where you, you shoot for 25%, but you have quality stable long-term return. And that really helps long-term investors and family offices and, and multilateral institutions. Dr. Levy, the World Bank is driving a lot of the, the, car, the work around carbon markets. Perhaps you, you want to weigh in with, with that uh, advice? Yes, uh, and there are many ways. First, I, I think that uh, what was mentioned about the private sector internalizing the risk 
and uh, respond uh, to the, the, what would be the real prices they'll be facing in the future. I think this is the change that is one of the most important change. But you have to help. And then there are many ways to do that. One is, for instance, with blending finance. So we would help with our balance sheet uh, either to reduce the risk so that you can attract a larger uh, group of uh, investors, or sometimes uh, lower the cost. We have some what you call concessional, low cost, uh, uh, say, uh, financing that together with the private sector could get to something that is attractive and is viable for the developers. In addition to this, uh, we have uh, the, for instance, new ways of financing, green bonds. We have just signed an MOU with one of the largest asset managers in the world to create a fund that we invest in green bonds issued by companies. And we, the World Bank, we were, um, I think, a pioneer on that. We have more than $16 billion of green funds, uh, green bonds issued. And uh, I think that this discussion is uh, even more important today. And we see some governments creating uh, say special incentives and uh, we are working that in, in, in complement to these incentives we also have very clear rules mm. so that what is labeled a green bond is actually green bond because this is a, a market that will grow wow. uh, more and I think we will start to have uh, some sort of differential in the rewards that investors will require for uh, green bonds which so far is not so clear so we have blending we have uh, the de-risking more, more generally. We have a number of vehicles to attract, uh, uh, say, private sector investment to buy green bonds from companies. And we ourselves are very active in this uh, space. But the rewards need to be... Well, the rewards of the blending is a way to uh, reward uh, those uh, sponsors, investors, that want to get in this new arena. So we have lower cost financing, which blended with market finance can make a uh, uh, project. So you de-risk the environment. Yeah, we de-risk and we also lower the cost because some entrants Only. need yes, some advantage. Let, let, let's make some more excitement in the discussion because otherwise we all agree and we wouldn't like to address Well, Sean Gua definitely doesn't agree. She says the banks are standing back and I was going right. to come to you and with And I that. would like to, I mean, we are aligned here, I would like to, to make that point even stronger and, and hopefully Joe Kim and Victor can help me here because they see the opportunities, they see the necessity, and the financial market sees the necessity, and we have the green bonds, and the private sector wants to engage. But how big are the green bonds of the total investments? How big 1%? How big um, is the financial sector involving this? If the financial sector sees the opportunities, and how much, Victor's point, long-term is the financial sector? And even the pension funds who are investing this, who have a 30 years horizon, are they addressing their fund managers on a 30 years long-term horizon, or are they asking of their fund managers in their pension funds to deliver a return in the next 12 months? So, so okay, what, do, what do you, do you want to see? in terms of the size well, of I'm, money I'm being totally put forward. Well, I'm totally with Victor and Joachim here that at the end of the day, uh, the private sector can only work on the long term. What can I do in the next 12 months? I need to engage to develop new technology, new developments, which takes uh, some time. So I cannot react on a 12-month period on this one. I need to have a long-term perspective. And I have those partners in the financial sector who are supporting that. But is that enough if that is only 1% of the financial sector? Well, Sean, and 99% of the financial enough. sector is still not yet fully there. Uh, I, I'm sort of aligned with that line. I see the, the gap, the inadequacies, you know, particularly from policy perspective. Actually, I wish somehow the, the speed, actually, the, the scaling up will be sort of sped up. Um, back to China, I think back to the green bond part. On the exciting part, actually, China today is already the world's largest green bond market, which is fascinating. But then if you look like at the percentage, it's very limited. Of course, there's a huge potential to grow. We are still sort of in that landscape trying to learn, you know, this is relatively new, the financial product, how do we make sure things will work well. So I'm hoping somehow we will be able to scale up very quickly, not only continue to lead the global green bond market, and besides bond, it's only one of the 
financial product, we need to expand it to, to overall actually financial sector, which is a sort of happening now. But as uh, Fike was uh, talking about it here, so there's a sort of the scale, the size today in terms of the expectations. There's a huge gap in between. And particular one thing actually in China, I think probably universally in other markets as well, the financial investors community, the mindset of today, the majority remains to be sort of risk averse, you know, and uh, short term versus longer term. They are pretty much like most of them on the short term side. How Let's stay we... with that theme for a moment. Fake, what is the impact of the US's withdrawal? And I put this out at the top of the conversation on the mindset of the very bankers that Shanghua is referring to. Well, with all respect to the United States, I think the impact is not big because we're over the hill and the 200... You don't think finance institutions are going to put further distance well, between well, themselves? Well, from the financial sector, that, that's a different point. Let me make one remark on that. But 200 governments agreed on Paris. Uh, the Chinese and the Europe made very clear they will continue that track. Even in the United States, California made very clear they will continue that track. Yep. So I think we're over the hill in terms of governments, we're over the hill in terms of the private sector. Even in the last Davos, the private sector said, increase the price on carbon from five euros per ton to what's at least 20 to 40 euros a ton because then it has a real impact. The scientists, the business community, even the public sector, I mean, they want to address it. Coming back on the price on carbon, I think personally the solution is the price on carbon. Because once we have, uh, let's say, $40 per ton price on carbon, then there is a clear economic incentive to address climate change right now. And the whole green bond and the financial sector will engage much faster. So not that I'm only playing for my own baby, this carbon pricing, but I think it is so important to speed up this whole development. And let's take a cue from the conversation in Davos on the return of carbon markets. You mentioned uh, Catherine McKenna, Minister of Environment from Canada, uh, very instrumental in the carbon market discussion. And uh, actually at that forum, we discussed a, a price of $50 a tonne. Correct. And, and Minister McKenna puts it very cleverly. She says that it's actually not a price on carbon. It is a price on pollution. Mm -hmm. Correct. Perhaps yeah. we, we take the discussion yeah. further. Uh, look, I, I think we, let, let Look at what is happening. Take, for instance, uh, the case of India. Uh, first, they have a tax on all the production of energy from coal, and they're using this money to finance renewable. Mm -hmm. And they have a tremendously ambitious uh, program in, in renewable. The, the, the growth of uh, energy in, in installed capacity in India in the next five or seven years will be bigger than the total installed capacity in the UK, for instance. So if you do it, greener or not so green, uh, it's like uh, replacing all the energy produced in the UK uh, just in five years in India. That real requires uh, more than almost $200 billion. Uh, so I think that the real challenge in terms of financing is there. And uh, they are, uh, they are mobiliz mobilizing these fiscal uh, resources through the taxation of uh, uh, energy from coal. Um, they have also their own banks. They're trying to align institutional investors. And uh, there is a role also for external investors going there. And this is why, for instance, IFC has issued a green bond in local currency, because a lot of this has to happen in local currency. So there is where I think the action in terms of financial innovation, you are core. And you have the same thing for Africa. Think about Nigeria, think about Kenya, South Africa. Well, there are so course, many opportunities. Well, of course, the opportunity exists to leapfrog, as oh. you said, the developed world with this new renewable technology. And the stats are that 1.1 billion people in the world don't have access to electricity at this mm -hmm. stage. And uh, Dr. Levy, you mentioned Africa. Half of those people reside in Africa. Absolutely. And now with solar, uh, mini grids, there's so many alternatives of, uh, of uh, technology. You have really to think uh, out of the box. We talk about uh, the fourth uh, uh, industrial revolution. I think it goes hands on hands on the way we're going to address the climate issues. Victor, I still want to come back mm. and push you on this, and I'm sorry to put you forward as a voice for investors generally <laughs> out there, but is that level of excitement tangible? I mean, you can feel yes. the passion on the stage. At this Let point. me explain why, where's the gap? We are at the 
at the ground floor of creating a new asset class, which is new. I think climate investment right now is not, um, is not uh, for everybody right now. It's not an institutional class investment. But when we come back to the annual meeting of the new champions next year, it will become uh, a new asset class. So when, when, it, when institutional investors accept this, we can do the uh, securitization of cash flow. That will give liquidity to people who take a shorter term horizon who wants liquidity, as well as longer term investors like ourselves who are willing to ride 20 years. So you need to have a rated uh, instrument backed up by institutions such as World Bank and, and, and others that the institutions can come in. And that's where you have the speed and the scale. We are at the forefront of the discussion. So, Shangwa, Victor's yeah. saying speed and scale will be achieved very quickly. You're mentioning the uh, summer Davos next, next year. year. Next year, do you agree? Uh, I definitely would like to see so, actually. Uh, but I want to go back to the barrier side. I think in order to deliver uh, the vision, the dream, uh, we need to look figure out how to overcome the barriers, actually, the blocks on the road. I think particularly for developing countries, emerging economies, uh, the financial sectors in the institutional part, actually, remains a major challenge. Yes, on the service side, you know, creating new assets or whatever, they need to be working really functionally in a contest with the institution governance in place in yes. order to make sure that works. And that's ha that happens to be a major, major barrier, not for China even today, let alone actually for many other developing countries. So we're talking, this is sort of a crowd of the same mindset, right, the, the exciting part, this, we all share the dream, whatever. But really coming down to the reality, we need to understand more the barriers and the constraints there. And I want to add back to the Trump uh, situation. To a certain extent, I probably tend to agree with the Faki, say, oh, you know, don't worry too much about it, whatever. But really, there are impacts. Impacts in a way is it's not fair. It's not morally responsible. So besides that, actually, I think it's against the major trend, the global trend towards creating a new economy, right? If you look at the EU, China already the joining... Key, the, what, I, what I want to understand about the, the US issue is whether the withdrawal will really set back climate change progress. That's, I think, Short -term. we must get to the, yes. Yeah, no, the, the couple of things to look at the impact. One, as I mentioned earlier, if you look at the financial sector's mindset today, the majority of them, they're not there yet, right? We're talking about a scaling up, but we're not putting everyone with us yet. So Trump's decision to pull out is a sort of uh, working, that's sort of aligned with that sort of mindset. That's really, really bad negative impact. The, the second point I just wanted to make, actually, so when the world actually is coming together, so we're going to work together to really develop, create a new assets, develop a new economy. The U.S. tone says, wait a second, we still want to hang on to the second or the old so Industrial Revolution. So let me revolution. bring Fakir in there. Shangwa saying this is a problem. You're saying, no, let's not worry about the U.S. We, well, we well, clearly well, let's not worry is maybe an overstatement, but I think we went over the hill and we will address climate change. By the way, we still need to see how the Trump administration will further react because the main point they made is that the deal itself is not a good deal for the US. Not totally denying that climate change needs to be addressed because it's very weird for countries, it's very weird for companies not to future-proof your society, not to future-proof your economy, not to future-proof your business. It's pretty stupid not to future-proof your business, and most companies will do that. What is exciting in this forum also is the fourth industrial revolution, that technological development to use agricultural waste. There's so much agriculture waste in the world, and we are doing it, even in the US, converting that into green energy. What's happening in solar, we recently, we employed 25,000 people, we said we have bright minds, but maybe there are brighter minds even outside our company. We had 80 million hits on a contest of asking people to contribute to boost the performance of solar cells. 80 million people looked on our website and looked at how to contribute. I am so sure that the new technological developments will speed up and will really create a new and future. And it's the biggest opportunity of the 21st century. Exactly. But as Shanghua said, very like-minded discussion. You know, each of the panelists is very passionate about this arena of climate change. Let's go back to, to the barriers. Uh, uh, Dr. Levy. I, I think there are a, a few barriers, but at the same time, uh, the reality is very clear. For instance, 2016 has been, uh, was the, the, the hottest uh, year 
uh, on record. And uh, this year also you see that happening. And uh, of course, uh, you remember a few years back when uh, you had this big hurricane in the east coast of the US, it uh, really changed the, the awareness of people. So I, I think that there are some things we hope it does take a, a catastrophe, but uh, uh, that are, are raising the awareness, including the business community. Now, in terms of the, the financial sector, um, I think that uh, you'll be this combination. New technologies that um, change the, the, the balance between traditional uh, the, uh, sources of power or way of building and so on, and new ones that, uh, the, think about solar, 10 years uh, ago and now, nobody discussed today, especially if you are, say, a, a rapidly increasing, uh, a growing country, uh, uh, using solar also has the advantage that the time to build and start to operate is a fraction of any other type of source. You can do a farm in two, three years it's eliminated rather than the in debate, seven the years. The debate used to be clean yeah. energy was too expensive to destroy. It's not there anymore. Yeah. The other thing, for instance, the case of, uh, of uh, green bonds, the reality is that investors so far uh, have not paid a premium for that, except very tiny groups. Uh, someone mentioned, let's go to a family office and so on. We've been doing that. We need more. In some cases, governments are start to think about giving some market signal. For instance, uh, if you use a green bond uh, to do a repo, your haircut, which is the discount that uh, you charge to use that as our uh, uh, counterpart or guarantee of uh, the money you're, you're taking from the central bank, might be smaller. So that means this bond is a little bit more valuable. Uh, and with these will create, of course, an additional demand. In France, they recently had some regulation also creating a demand from banks. So it's always tricky to have new demand created by government, but sometimes as a coordination device, could be helpful and they do make uh, easier for us as World Bank also to get uh, into action supporting issues around the world. Well, we, Fakir, I, I do want to come to you and once you've made your point, I've got another question for you. So make well, your point. Uh, building on what Joe is saying, we need to look more to the pension funds also because where is by far most of our money coming from, from pension funds? Who is owning that money? Not the funds, it basically we all, it's our money. Good. Is climate change a real issue? Yes. Will we, at the end of the day, pay the bill? Yes. Is the whole world agreeing on that? Yes. Then it is good for our society, with our own pension money, to invest that in the right things to address climate change. Because if we only make short-term gains with our pension money, then at the end of the day, we all pay from our investments on the short term in our pension money, at the end of the day, all of us, we pay the bill. So I think we need to address the pension fund stronger, that it is in the benefit of their pensionados, their people who provide the money, to address and to invest in things like fixed Okay, Before investment. I go to Chan Hua, I want to find out, put the same question that mm. I put to, to Victor earlier, but now with the business standpoint. Again, I'm going to use that word because I don't know how else to describe it, is we see the passion. But I want to understand your peer group. Is business uniting behind you? Talk about the global CEO climate group. Have I got the right terminology? Right. I mean, do wow. you see this level of excitement <laughs> on, a, on a large scale? We're talking about scale that Shang Wai wants to bring to the party. Well, all CEOs are, are free, of course, to, to react as, as, as they want to do. But if I look to the climate ambassador and climate leaders of the World Economic Forum, around 80 CEOs. We had a big meeting in Davos a year ago, last Davos, and we see that 80 big multinational companies are behind taking more stronger, faster measures on addressing climate change. They ask governments, please act faster, stricter, please put a price on carbon, please don't keep it at five euros a ton, but bring it to 40 euros a ton because then it really has an impact on us. We saw a year ago in the FT of 80 multinational companies making a plea, said please governments address it. We saw more than 80 companies reacting on the withdrawal from the US recently that they are disappointed and they are not in favor of this decision. I saw no CEOs responding this was a great decision. So are many CEOs behind? Yes. And is it? 
because they want to do good for the world? Maybe also. But also because they're good business people and want to future-proof their economy. 80 multinationals, is that scale? Yes, no, I want to get back to the passion fund part. So I, when Faki was mentioning that, I remembered vividly I was participating in some sort of sessions in Paris back in 2015. That was exactly the language, the tone, everything like that. So between then and now, there's some progress, whatever. I think we need to understand why not adequate sort of progress made. I know there are many barriers, whatever we need to figure out, but we need, really need to drive down, drive home the issue asking why not, why not yet. Uh, on the positive side, actually, a, a couple of things. One, I think financial, globally financial institutions really, really need to come together. So you have the like minds already here, but somehow within the financial sectors, including pension fund, whatever, multinational, you know, private equity, VC, whatever, really need to come together to drive through, to scale up. Second point on the positive side, we started to see, I mentioned actually DSM sort of internalizing the carbon pricing, you know, to drive the actions, innovations there. Then you started to have, for instance, Qinghai this week, actually in China, in northwestern part of China, literally achieving 100% renewable this week, literally now. Then you have Apple uh, back to the Earth Day committing to 100% re reusable recycling materials actually for the products down the future. So there are some sparse or stars actually like that on the ground. I think the issue needs, the attention needs to be focused on the last mile. We need to somehow let the leaders lead the scale up in the meantime, really recognizing the barriers we need to overcome. Without enough efforts on that, we're not going to you know, scale up at the speed we would like to see. Yeah. Victor? I think we have to uh, be patient slightly because in order for the pension funds, the institutions to come in, uh, it, we have to make sure the governance is there. I think for any private finance initiative that is uh, part of the requirement of a PPP, you need that statutory framework. So it has to be a two-speed or three-speed process. The, the countries where there's established governance system like uh, Europe, North America, Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan. I think this will be the first. We can do it tomorrow, right? Where countries where they have um, a not a f freely convertible currency, um, not a, a statutory framework established, we need to find a way to, to make sure that both domestic and international investors are able to support these projects in a way that government are also supporting. So there will be two speed. But I think we just have to get on. I think the, 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 the interest is there, the passion is there. We have to get, because every project is better than none. And I think um, the hesitation in uh, White House also galvanized the excitement from the, uh, from the grassroots. As you see, uh, Jerry Brown and Michael Bloomberg and the cities are reacting. And that's where the, the influence that we need. I hope. Victor, let me get Dr. Levy to come in yeah. here because he, the, the minute we mentioned framework and, and structure, you indicated you wanted to come in. Of course, we have got a dynamic building here. Patience, you're asking for patience, but you are saying it's two speed. Speed is very much at the center of what you are asking for, Shangwa. Dr. Levy? Yeah, look, um, the, first, um, I'm responsible, for instance, with, uh, for the, the pensions in, in the case of the, the World Bank. I'm the chairman of the, the committee. And in my, my previous life, I was an asset manager and very much involved the PRI and other initiatives. Uh, I think that one uh, thing that we have to do to go beyond uh, the, this group is really to continue the work of framing the, the issue in terms of risk. In the language that, for instance, uh, a pension fund manager can operate. They have fiduciary responsibilities. They have to have the information to show that they're doing that not because they believe on something or ideology, let's call it, but really because they're doing a very clear assessment of risk and it does make sense. Uh, to make such and such choices. And this is what I think was the big innovation of the FSB initiative of uh, uh, creating a framework for people to uh, analyze the risk of companies if they don't uh, uh, adapt to uh, the, the, the possibilities of, of uh, climate change. It's called the stranded asset risks and other things that could change the value 
of a company. And then for an investor, that means changing the value of your investment. I think this conversation has to be accelerated. We are working with UNAP, for instance, in the green, uh, green finance initiative. And really what I think is one of the priorities is to create this language that you can bring more people to the conversation, uh, but uh, align. More quickly. You spoke about acceleration, so bringing more people to the table more quickly. Yes, well, but, but you have to well, align okay. to the incentives and constraints that they face, mm -hmm. and sometimes even changing them a little bit so that they can really react. So well, I think Joachim makes a very important point, which we should not forget. If the central banks, Mark Carney, Bank of England, but also the Dutch central bank, several central banks, the financial stability board said, hey guys, there is a big risk not to address climate change, not so much from an environmental or human point of view, but from a financial stability point of view, talking about stranded assets, etc. This is a big signal from the central banks to the financial world, purely from a financial and economic perspective. And from a financial world, if I would work in a financial world, I would say, hey, if my central banks are warning me uh, on my investments, this is an important message not to put under the carpet. And I think it's a very important point uh, which you makes. I want you to take some comments from the audience at this point. And if I could start with uh, Zhang Xingsheng, who's president of the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Uh, so if you could come into our conversation at this point. Uh, thank you, my dear colleagues. Excuse me, I just arrived from Paris. And uh, frontier of climate change action. Maybe I can point three. Microphone. The first one, uh, which is uh, maybe new to many of you, it is that we, can have, you hold a, it closer, we, we have a very, very successful conference in Paris and organized by the President of COP21 Climate Change. Uh, he is now President of the High Court Constitution of the uh, French Republic, Mr. Laurent Fabius, and also former Secretary Pan Ki Pong, Arnold uh, Swashinje, former Governor of uh, uh, California State. Finally, uh, new President Macron also come to join. What for? According to Fabius, it's a paradox after climate change Paris Agreement. What need? Three words, need action. Action urgently. Finally, we decide. They decided with our organization, we decide action by law. What is action by law? This is the final, our preliminary product. The Global Pact for the Environment. Yes, for our planet and also uh, for the <coughs> this world. This one, we have taken about two years. You know, IUCN is a source of the environmental law. In 1972, uh, many people, politically, economically, industrially, scientifically, had no knowledge about uh, environment need a law. We know that so, so far, US only have uh, a few environment court, right? Which is so complicated for environment issue, right? Uh, this is the one simplify our, since 1972, all the environment regulations and laws. Some items are very, very, uh, Interesting Dr. Zhang, I, I, I definitely hold the discussion in, in high regard. I want to bring FICA in at this point. Again, we hear action, civil society saying action, and you are saying it's there, but we need more scale. scale. So what can we do at this juncture? And, and let's put timelines in. I mean, Victor, you gave us a timeline. You said Dalian next year. Uh, Tianjin. No, Tianjin next year. Tianjin, <laughs> apologies, Tianjin <laughs> next year. You will see investors coming to the party in large, in large scale. No, it'll Can I a, use that? It'll, it'll become a, a new. It'll be more established of an asset, new asset class to enable institutions to look at it in their, in their allocation. That's what I meant. 
it will become a new, more established asset class. And then suddenly the framework will be yeah. developed, so you'll see everybody It's the language that uh, exactly. uh, Luca mentioned. Yeah. The framework, yeah. exactly. Now, in our side, I mean, back in 2015, uh, just before of the Paris meeting, we had uh, agreed to increase uh, the share of uh, our operation geared to climate change from about 15, below 20, to 28 percent by 2020. So, we, uh, of course, these things take time. So, you are working today to be sure that by 2020, uh, at least 20 percent of our operations will be geared to that. But more than that, we are also working that we are not alone. We, of course, you have the other MDBs, and now in the G20, um, we, we have agreed some common strategy across the development banks, but also mobilizing the private sector. Most of what you're doing these days is really how you can get a bigger share of the private sector going hand in hand with our own activities. Like I said in the beginning, for instance, we come with blending, we make some uh, uh, deals uh, more feasible so that you can scale this Dr. up. Dr. Livia, I also would come back, Shangwa, what about civil society and mobilizing people on the ground? Mm -hmm in large quantities. Uh, absolutely necessary, and that has to happen. Uh, on one side, I think existing civil society organizations are already taking part and playing their role. In the meantime, actually put that in under the lens of the fourth industrial revolution, you started to see actually not only the conventional players actually of the civil society advocating pushing uh, climate economy, but more and more importantly, we, we, we're going to bring more innovators, actually younger generations into that process. And that is happening. That's also an area that needs scale because they, we need to bring, we need to know, to be aware of who are the new players on the horizon. We need to bring them together because only by you know, convening the resources, expertise, the passion together, we'll be able to deliver the scale we would like to see. Faike, you want to come in here? Well, I want to recognize the point Mr. Zhang made and we discussed a couple of times together uh, on the importance of preservation of nature. But I also would like to recognize the point of Joachim about what the World Bank and IFC can do in terms of what you called before leapfrogging. It is very fascinating to see that, especially in Africa, people are thinking about what new technologies on solar can do. Yeah. And there is a lot of thinking, especially in Africa, because they are behind about off-grid providing electricity. And in Europe, there is not so much thinking about off-grid electricity, because our whole thinking process, is, thinking process is that electricity comes from the grid. But in many African countries, the thinking is very much advanced on leapfrogging in technology, is to provide most of the electricity off-grid. And I think here, IFC and the World Bank and other financial institutions can play a very important role in leapfrogging those technologies. And the grassroots response to that is absolutely fantastic. People, I was yesterday talking with some people from Nigeria, uh, and really the, the private sector, but people in all communities, this is the way they see things moving, and they're giving all support to put whatever regulation is needed to achieve that. I just want to check on the audience. I ha I'm cognizant of time, I have 10 minutes left. Are there any statements or comments that anybody would like to make? Shangwa, you wanted to go forward? Yes. and. Uh, uh, Early on in the beginning, there's a number you mentioned actually, $23 trillion. The number seems to be big, but probably not big enough because today we're literally talking about how emerging economies and other developing countries grow their economy differently. Right? So this is not about to say, okay, we had to grow the economy whatever the way we have to, but on the, on the other side, actually, on the side we have to deal with the climate change issues. No, this is the moment actually to make sure developing countries in particular really capture the opportunity here to grow our economy very, very differently, fundamentally different from the conventional, the previous industrial revolution. Dr. Zhang, do you believe the leadership is in place? You say you've just come back from, from Paris. The leadership is in place to take advantage of the opportunity that we started the discussion with, and that is the $23 trillion that Shanghua refers to. Is the leadership in place, sir? Thank you, Nelson. Leadership is always there, but just sometimes being interrupted. But one leadership have a vacancy, another leadership fill in. This is something I have optimistic, number one. Number two, I have three points to draw if you really want me to say what is really new frontier 
of a climate. I think that all of you want to listen. This is the one you cannot look down upon it. You know, you, you cannot like me say I'm not a judge because over there are all the supreme judge of supreme court of the world. So Dr. And Zhang, you said three points. I'm yes. going to push you, sir, because I do only have okay, eight okay. minutes left. This is number one. Number two, for investment, I agree with Qianghua and Dismond. This is not enough. So we are working with the nature capital. IUCN and my NGO, Ecoforum Global in China, leading nature capital. We believe that nature resources will finally tend to capital. China now already start. Every governor, mayor, has to sign agreement for the balance sheet of natural assets. When I'm you going to ask you your for term. your third point. I'm so sorry to do this to you, yeah. but I really have got okay. five minutes Good. to make closing comments. Good. Third point is that green growth, green development is not a burden, it's a cost. Whoever do not do that must lose in the next term. We cannot just stay on the benevolence or CSR of corporate to satisfy that. That like warm water boiling the frog. Thank you. Powerful words, Dr. Zhang. And I think we're going to move to closing comments at this stage, given the time pressures upon us. Let's go back to the topic that we were asked to debate. And uh, Shanghua, you brought us back to it. It's that $23 trillion opportunity as set out by the IFC. And as a result, if you read into that report, as a result of the Paris Accord in December 2015, this is why these opportunities are arising. And that $23 trillion opportunity is from today till 2030. The question we were asked is the leadership, is the right leadership at the table and beyond the table, let's add that, to really take advantage of this opportunity. And, and let's put a time frame to it. So how long do you think it's going to take to realize that opportunity? Five, 10, 15 years longer? Fike, we'll go around the table and uh, we've got five minutes to close. No, much faster because all businesses, and let me speak for the business and let me advise from a business perspective, should future-proof the business right now by doing three things. Reduce your own emissions because one day you will be forced to pay the bill and there will be a price on carbon. Second, next to reduce, enable your full supply chain to reduce the carbon emissions by developing products like we do also which making addressing climate change a business opportunity for you. And next to reduce and enable, third point, what we do here also, advocate that we need to address climate change right now. So much sooner, give me a time frame. I'm not letting you get off that. that I easy. hope most CEOs, if I talk for the business sector, I hope most CEOs start acting this year. I would not advise any CEO to postpone I say it again, to postpone future-proofing your business. What you is your are not a good CEO to, if you postpone to future-proof your business. What is your message to the Chinese CEOs, to Asian CEOs? Start acting right now. Before the year end, China has a price on carbon. 7,000 Chinese companies at the end of this year will be confronted with a price on carbon. So the future starts today, this year. Yeah. Shangwe, please also, in your closing yes. comments, can you talk to the carbon market that China is set to launch at the end of this year, the largest in the world? Yes, uh, China definitely on the right track, and the boat is already off uh, the harbor, and uh, so we're not literally sailing now. And uh, hopefully, so the price on carbon, particular carbon market that China is doing now, we're going to play a very important role to drive the solutions there. Back to the issue about the horizon, I probably would realistically look into a, ten, a, de a decade sort of horizon. And I'm hoping, like in 10 years' time, when we gather here, either Daniel or Tianjin, we're going to celebrate. I think we're going to celebrate the successes or achievements already. Then, of course, we're going to continue to address other challenges there. Last point, actually, I think in China, the mindset, the presence of the mindset is green is gold. That tells you something. Thing, tells you say this is a really different this is a moment we need to capture to grow our economy you know our society very very differently and green is good like it or not that's going to happen Victor of course the time is now and I can um, say that the energy efficiency is the best investment I found in the last 10 years but I'd like to bring up a very basic point uh, first no amount of investment is enough this is going to be a permanent challenge for all of us. Sure. But more importantly is education. We need to educate our young how to conserve energy. 
I think that's the, the fundamental. It's not just investment, it's also habit, it's the culture of using energy smartly, efficiently and responsibly. And I think that's also a key word. It has to go side by side with investments. Dr Levy? Well, I, I'd say two main things. One is that we have to marry this discussion to the new technologies. Just think, for instance, we mentioned Africa. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, to have the light in one house would take 60 uh, watts, at least. Now with LED, we would take two, three, five maximum. That changed completely the, the, the equation and what you need. And uh, so this is what I think business are starting to realize. The whole way the economy works, you'll be so, so different. And the economy of the future, the economy of information and so on, you have such different uh, demands on, uh, on, on energy, including on mobility, uh, supply chains, and so on and so forth, that I think that you're talking about the time horizon. I think that there is a compression because people will start to think what this new technology means in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, consumption of energy and footprint and so on and so forth. So, and there as well, also where I think the, the, the financial sector will wake up and realize what it means 23 billion. It's not 23 trillion of, say, voluntaristic. Uh, investment to be green. It's really 23 uh, trillion of opportunities of rewiring uh, completely the, the, the economy. And one final thought. I come from a country where many years ago we need to reduce uh, electricity consumption by 20 percent. And we managed that just by price signals. We, we got some sort of trade between, say, uh, electricity intensive sectors, melters and smelters and so on, and all the other sectors that need a little bit but need some energy. And by getting price right, you reduce uh, consumption by 20% without really affecting GDP. And that's the power of price systems. Dr. Zanga, I want to give you the final word, sir. And I want you to give us the most important message that you feel we need to take away from this forum. Okay. Science already approved is evidence. We're already late. It's already one degree raised before Industrial Revolution. So how can we achieve two degrees before first Industrial Revolution? So must act, number one. is fundamental. Science is there. And number two is that leadership. Even though one big player pulled out, but now we are more organized. Okay. I draw your attention to pay attention to this pact, okay? And this pact has some items to say that uh, rights, when we talk human rights, now we talk rights of ecologically sound environment. Then we have a regression term, form, item. Regression, you know, this legal term. Then we also have a term about the pollution pay. Last but not least, China now has a three provinces has a designate as a pilot province for what we call the eco civilization It's the China version for SDG 2030 agenda and the climate change. So please draw attention to that. It's somewhat like the Deng Xiaoping's in 1980. Have a three, have five Certainly special economic zones. Certainly draw attention to zone. it, Dr. Zhang. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you to our distinguished panelists for this spirited debate. It's been a great opportunity and let's take the conversation forward, but action, action, action. I think that was reiterated across the board. Thank you so much for joining us.